Okay, we're just going to give everybody a couple minutes so that we can get this, the um, stragglers in here. It is just now 7.59. We'll give them a couple minutes in case there are any latecomers, then we'll get started shortly. All right, if Rob's going to be racking a slide, I'm going to start racking my slides, too. Hey, that wasn't me. <laughs> this thing on this end, it's going to be me pouring another beverage. Um, <laughs> it's, it's that time of day for just about everybody, right? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay, we're going to give everybody about one more minute, and while we're waiting, just to see who's awake and paying attention here, um, I've got a little poll. I'm going to I'm going to send out a poll. We'll see if we can get a little yes or no question from people. Um, can everybody see the poll that I've just launched? Have you ever received training? The one that starts that. If so, there is a yes and no button below that. Go ahead and, and select yes or no for me. We'll see, we'll just make sure that the functions are working on this whole thing. Well, this is Rob, and I am not receiving. Oh, it just showed up. Huh. Yep, same here. Oh. Okay. Oh, good job. 94% voted already. Okay, cool. We're only missing one or two people then um, as far as attendees answering these things. And Rob, it looks like you've got some seasoned vets to talk to. 76% of these people have already received training um, as opposed to the 24% of the of the people who chimed in with a no. So we'll keep that up for another couple seconds here and then we'll go back. But, oh, 78% yes. So yeah, that's, that's good. We'll have a lot of like-minded people here then. Good, good, good. Good, everyone. Awesome. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started then. Um, it looks like we had uh, just one or two people jump on last minute there, and as if people do come in, then no big deal. But um, I want to make sure that we've got enough time to get through questions and um, start everybody off on the right foot. So first of all, thank you everybody for attending. This is our very first webinar, one of what we hope will be many. Um, and we thought we'd kick it off with uh, an awesome guest speaker. I'm sure Many of you have heard of Rob Pincus before. We're going to get to know him pretty well over the next the, the course of the next hour here. Um, and just to let you know a little bit about how this webinar works, you saw the poll, you know, one of the polls. I may do that once or twice. I've got a couple other questions here just in case. Um, but, you know, the, the main part of tonight is going to be the Q&A. So what I would have you do on the right-hand side of your screen or in that little toolbar that pops up with the webinar, um, there is an area to put questions or to chat. Either one works. Jot down your questions for me and send them along. I'll be alerted when you submit those questions. Um, and I'd love to, to see what you guys are interested in learning from Mr. Pincus here. So just pop them in the questions or the chat area, and I will put them on my little list, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, I do have some that were previously submitted as well. So 
if you think of anything, that's the right place to do it. Um, if you have any questions in general, do it there too. So um, if you and if you do have any questions about that, feel free to. If you're having a technical issue of any sort, um, my direct email is Jennifer J E N N I F E R at sdi.edu. Um, I've got my phone next to me, so it will give me a, a little notification if somebody's having a problem. So. Um, my name is Jennifer McInnes. I'm in the marketing and operations side of things here at SDI School of Firearms Technology. Um, joining me tonight is Zeke Stout, the chair of the SDI School of Firearms Technology, and of course, our, uh, Rob Pincus, our um, guest expert for tonight. Um, so let's go ahead and just dive in. As far as tonight goes, we're going to keep it casual. Um, we will tell you a little bit about the school. We'll give you a brief bio on Rob, but really, he's the man of the hour here, so I want to make sure that he's getting as much time as, as he can. So. Um, just so that uh, everybody kind of knows a little bit about the school, people are coming from all over the place for this webinar. A lot of you guys have signed up who are already on our newsletter list and, and things like that. Um, but a lot of people came from Rob's network or from a, you know, a totally different area here. And just to let you know a little bit about us, we are um, an accredited distance learning school. We specialize in firearms. Um, we do have other programs uh, as well, medical home inspection types of things, IT, but really our flagship programs are our firearms training programs. Um, we are accredited by the DEAC, which is a national accreditation council, which is pretty unique. Um, there aren't a whole lot of firearms degree programs or, or accredited programs in general, so that's something that we take a lot of pride in. Um, we do offer a couple interesting options for people. Uh, you don't have to pick up and move to go to school. Everything is shipped to your door. You do everything via learning management system. Um, we try to make it as flexible as possible because our students come from a lot of different walks of life, um, and we especially want to be military friendly. So our guys that are active duty, they could be stationed anywhere in the world. Um, we're still trying to accommodate everybody, and we do so by offering that flexible study schedule um, and the at-home training. However, um, as Zeke will probably tell you, we are constantly pounding the pavement on ways to make our curriculum and our programs better. Um, so as far as the, the training goes, this is what we feel will be the best in the nation as far as firearms training goes for from a gunsmithing standpoint and a firearms technology standpoint. So um, we do have a couple different programs and courses. You'll notice the asterisk there um, on the top two. Our Associate of Science and Firearms Technology degree program is a 60 credit hour course that is approved for use of VA benefits. Um, and the Advanced Gunsmithing Certificate is as well. That's a 32 credit hour course. Both of those, you know, GI bills, um, reservist GI bills, any other VA benefits that you, you know, voc rehab, we take all of them. Um, and we are actively in the process of being back to being TA approved. We have no information on, you know, if and when that's going to happen, but we are working. Um, beyond that, we have uh, a couple non-credit courses. Our gunsmithing certificate is perfect for a hobbyist who just kind of wants to um, gain a credential, work on the side, that type of thing. We have a ballistics and reloading certificate um, with which we're working, uh, I guess we're working with then um, Gun Digest and Hornady on that one. So we get a lot of great con content and tools there. And then um, our two armor courses right now are AR-10 and AR-15. Um, those are available either as a standalone course or as part of the Advanced Gunsmithing Certificate and the Associate of Science um, degree program. So if you have questions, the contact information is down there as well. Um, we will, we are recording this whole thing. Uh, you'll get the link to that and then you'll have contact information in that email too. So, um, Zeke, I'm going to throw it over to you for a second here to kind of talk about some of the cool stuff the school has been working on. Um, obviously, you're the guy to talk to about that type of thing. So if you want to walk us through that, that'd be awesome. Sure. Uh, along with what we're constantly doing is we're constantly trying to make sure that we're having the most current updated curriculum on all of the firearms in the firearms industry. So one of the things we're doing is we're going to different manufacturers and saying, help us with your content. <clears throat> we don't just want to teach generalities that we can find on the internet. You know, help us to make sure we're teaching the exact right thing to your spec specifications. Um, another thing that's really excited that we just announced, I think it was about a month ago, is we're starting field study programs. I'm so glad. you'll have an. I had forgotten about that. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll have. I do field studies. <laughs> 
Yep. So with the advanced gunsmithing certificate and also the associate's degree, you'll have an opportunity to go to a manufacturer, a gunsmithing shop, somewhere within the country where we've set up the field studies and have three weeks of kind of a work slash, not necessarily an internship, but it's you're, you're actually getting the hands-on education from that particular manufacturer. So you'll you'll get a lot more hands-on there. Yeah, that one's a that one's a neat part of the process. Um, we currently have six locations uh, available for field studies. We yep. have a ton of information on that up on the website. Probably at the end of this week, we're just grabbing a couple extra documents from some of the partners who are who are hosting these events. Um, but it will be a selective process, but it'll be frequent as well. So typically, like Zeke said, they're like three hours, or th excuse me, three weeks in length. They'll have maybe a week off and then the next batch of students can go in. But they are small groups, so um, if, you're, if anybody attending is currently enrolled in either of those two programs and is interested in that, um, you can email fieldstudy at sdi.edu for more information, but we will make a big email blast about it as well at the end of the week when we have um, all that information on the website. So, anything else, Zeke, before we move forward? Well, that's it. Okay. We can keep going. Oh, awesome. Okay, so let's talk about Rob Pink is here. Rob, you with us still? I am. I'm sure I've been boring you to tears. I'm sorry. <laughs> he usually he usually hangs up after I've talked, but I'm impressed this time. <laughs> well, I wouldn't have been just about <laughs> So just to um for those of you who aren't familiar with like the hardest working man in the industry, um Rob Pink is one of the reasons that we brought him in, obviously, other than just being an epic individual. He's a, uh, an SDA School of Firearms Technology Advis Adv Advisory Board member, excuse me. Um, but he is really kind of the end-all, be-all when it comes to personal defense training. So um, you can see some of these big credentials here. The, obviously, the keynote ones are, are that he's the founder of the IC Training Company, um, Personal Defense Network. He has developed... Um, a hugely popular uh, nationwide CFS, the Combat Focus Shooting Program, um, which then other instructors can can produce, you know, in their own um, in their own realms. He's also, and this Rob, I didn't know this about you with the out, the Outdoor Channel TV series. He's hosted three Outdoor Channel TV series. Um, has a rich history in both law enforcement and also military, and currently. How many days out of the year do you travel, Rob? I heard something like 340 of the of the days of the year you're on the road. Since 2009, it's been uh, 300 to 320, but this year uh, I'm taking most of Q3 and Q4 uh, for off, we're off, and we're off. I'm having. Uh, I'm going to be spending a lot more time uh, doing things like distance education and uh, some more writing and video work and, and teaching a lot here at the Western HQ in Colorado. But yeah, it's traditionally it's been over 300 uh, days a year since we shut down Valhalla Training Center in uh, 2008, 2009, 2007, and then 2008 I moved out to the East Coast and started traveling again. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd love to hear a little bit more about. Well, I'd love to hear a little bit more about. I've got a little a bit of an audio. I've got a little a bit of an audio issue here. Issue here. Can everybody hear the feedback, or is that just me? Can everybody hear the feedback, or is that just me? Zeke. Zeke. <laughs> Rob, can you hear me? Rob, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, it sounded clear to me, but okay. If it sounds clear to you, that's fine. I'm getting a little bit quicker to make sure that everybody can make sure that everything well. So um, it sounds like there's four of us. Sounds like there's four. Okay, okay, hold on. Okay, okay, hold on. I don't know what that is? What that is? Let me turn these on. Check test one two. Can you hear me? Check test one two. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Any. Checked it. Okay. Oh, Weird. It was working perfect. Weird. It was working perfect. Do you have speakers on, and or are you using the headset? Yeah, I've got speakers on. Um, but I haven't changed anything. It's probably because there's a lag. Yeah, that could be it. Hmm. Okay. Well. Um, I will try to speak this a little bit. This is part of the unique us. charm of doing the first webinar. What was that? What was that? This is part of that unique charm of doing the first webinar. I know. I know. Well, and I, I, you know, I tested it all day today, and it was totally fine. And then I don't know what's going on right now. Um, um, one quick thing here. One quick thing here. Let's see. One quick thing here. Um, 
Usually if you put on just like a set of headphones, like even if it's iPod earbuds, that might help. Yeah, they're in the, I, I just plugged them in. Yeah, it didn't do anything. Hmm. Okay, one second here. One second here. Okay, is that any better? Is that any better? Oh. Uh, still, still sounds good to me. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, that might have done it. I don't know what it was. Okay, we'll just we're gonna move forward and Rob. Yeah, that's fixed. Okay, awesome. Rob, if you wouldn't mind um, telling us a little bit about what you're currently doing with PDN um, and especially about the tour, I'd love to hear a little bit about that uh, and kind of. Yeah. So the the uh, starting in 2008 when I started traveling again after the uh, Valhalla Training Center era out here in Colorado, uh, we we just sort of on a lark we did a T-shirt. Uh, we called the Combat Focus Tour T-shirt, and it kind of listed all the cities I had taught in in 2008. And that became, uh, going into 2009, kind of the way we referred to the training schedule, especially the spring and summer, because that was always the busiest time of the year. And the idea was, from a business development standpoint, to stop um, needing to just say yes to everybody who would allow me to go train or invite mm -hmm. me to go train, uh, and kind of zigzagging across the country. I'd be in Iowa one week and then I go to Texas and then up to Montana and then you know California and then Jersey and then Nevada and it just didn't make any sense and it's obviously more expensive and, and all those costs ends up filtering on to the students so instead of zigzagging around the country by 2010 we were able to get a much more linear travel schedule set up we got far enough ahead in our bookings with the venues and the ranges that I would use you know and the reason I, I like to travel a lot of reasons A I just like to travel but B it's also you know if you have 12 students and they all have to get on a plane and they all have to fly or they all have to drive and they have to pay for hotels and they have to pay for restaurants obviously then the bottom line cost of a training event goes way up uh, and instead of just like I get on a plane or get in a car and drive somewhere then those 12 students share the, the expense essentially of one person traveling and one person staying in hotels and one person uh, at restaurants. Now certainly while I'm traveling because I'm not going to necessarily come to everybody's hometown, there's still you know 50 to 60 percent of the students in any given class are probably traveling as well, but it still cuts down, makes it a lot easier for a lot of people to train. People who may not be able to afford to get on a plane and go across country to, to train, uh, get to train because I show up in their hometown. So that evolved over a number of years to the point where it made sense around all the social media, especially you know once social media really started growing in our community, and, and Facebook had a lot to do with that, uh, Twitter certainly, and now Instagram, it, we had a lot of people following the tour. So the, that audience, it made sense to take some of the companies that I had partnered with over the years, companies like Crossbreed Holsters, which I've you know, designed products for and worked with forever, uh, Gun Vault that I've worked with forever on different TV shows, and of course I use the, the product myself, um, taking them and letting them sponsor the tour to get more advertising value out of it and obviously to cover some of the expenses as well and make it even easier to bring the training to more remote areas where there might be fewer students because again the the, the expense of, of flying to the middle of nowhere where there's going to be two students on a range you, you, know, you can't run a business that way but we really do want to bring the training to as many people as possible so over that years over the years of evolution by 2012 we decided to take one of my other projects personal defense network and meld uh, kind of meld it with my ICE training company and combat focus shooting traveling tour that I was doing um, for the spring and summer. So we formally sold the, uh, we formally went ahead and started selling the advertising opportunities so that we could subsidize the expense of not only myself but also other instructors being able to travel and go into places where they wouldn't normally go. So we started the idea of a cross country drive. Uh, that I would start in Florida and end in the Pacific Northwest and we get other instructors who were contributing to the personal defense network and help subsidize some of their travel as well so that we could go to places along that my route and then these other guys could travel maybe some of them who weren't traveling a lot could start traveling and bringing their business out to other people that wanted the training after reading the articles or watching the videos at personal defense network and being able to, to go to places where 
there was a demand for training and that demand wasn't being met. So that was really the, the initial impetus of the tour was really just the concept of a t-shirt and, and calling it a tour. And then that really developed into a, a business model which now has, has developed training communities in some remote areas, gotten some instructors who weren't traveling to, to be able to, to justify going out and traveling as being part of the tour. And it now, uh, this year, because of my, my change in the way I'm going to handle the second half of the year, my, about 80% of my classes personally will be done during the tour between March and July. And in normal year, it's about 60% of my classes. And uh, it's, it's really just become a great uh, travel opportunity for me, a great you know, interaction with, with the people that follow Personal Defense Network. And we, this year, we have 10 other instructors from PDN who are also participating. That's awesome. Very, very cool. And I know that you've, um, for a long time now, done the training videos and, and that type of thing. Um, so I, I'd like to talk a little bit about the distance part of that, knowing that that's going to be a bigger part of what you do you know, for, for at least the latter part of the year. Um, do you... Yeah, all of this stuff that, that we've been doing with the television shows, with the books. You know, I wrote my first book in 2006. We've got the, the Outdoor Channel shows that I've worked on. I've been a guest on who knows how many you know, news programs, uh, obviously firearms training programs, outdoor-oriented programs, talk shows, whatever. All of that, as far as I'm concerned, is, is under that umbrella of distance education. Now, what, what SDI does is a very formal version of distance education. It's sure. obviously an accredited school and I was honored when Zeke asked me to sit on the board of advisors because this is the direction that, that my company has been moving and the Personal Defense Network has been moving in for a long time. We started the DVD series in 2005. We've had over 7 million DVDs distributed. Um, we've got about 80 different titles in the collection. There's about uh, 25 other instructors uh, in addition to myself yeah, because you know, I don't even want to watch 80 DVDs of me. Right, so it's, it's, we started bringing other guys with other specialties that that are areas like like medicine or some of the unarmed things, areas that I could probably speak on and I certainly have spoke on and could touch on, but that I'm not the expert in. So we we started bringing in other experts uh, to to round out the Personal Defense Network contributor team, and that DVD series has been really well. It's been uh, co-branded and co-distributed with the NRA, with Guns and Ammo Magazine, with the Second Amendment Foundation over the years. Uh, we have. A huge number of subscribers. We then took that and made it an online presence, and that's what Personal Defense Network is. That grew out of the DVD series, and again, that's distance education in as much as people can go watch the videos and and read the articles. But what we started doing, what I started doing in 2012, I launched my first distance education program in in the formal traditional sense, where we would ship someone the book and the DVDs and the audio and the workbook and they would go through all the coursework and then they'd be able to go online and take the online test and if they passed the test uh, they would get a certificate of completion for that course and it was really well received it was a project they did with the US Concealed Carry Association uh, really well received really uh, very well responded to and to, to this day uh, most of the people who graduated from that class um, everyone that I'm aware of has, has had a positive experience with it I haven't had anyone say gee that wasn't worth it or this was a scam or any of that kind of stuff but most of the, the feedback I've gotten are, are people saying not only was it really valuable but that they were surprised how valuable it was so they, they went into it sort of figuring well I'm getting the DVD lectures I'm getting a book I'd, I'd buy Rob's book or DVDs anyway let me do this as a course and really being surprised how much they got out of it and how much more the the workbook and or the online testing kind of forced them to get out of the material and that material in particular is called our counter ambush program that counter ambush training program was taken from our instructor development programs it's sort of the justification the whys the background the deeper intellectual material behind what we teach in the uh, combat focus shooting program and some of our other classes so people will say well gee how can you teach some how can you teach personal defense uh, through distance education and we're not talking about teaching somebody how to shoot or manage recoil per se. We're, we're teaching them all the concepts that underlie the, their selection of techniques, the, the gear they choose, the way they train on the range, uh, their tactics, all those kinds of things. And so that's been very well received. So uh, we've been experimenting now through Personal Defense Network. And a few years ago, we also launched the Association of Defensive Shooting Instructors, which has done uh, three online courses for distance education for people who are interested in teaching. And obviously that's my now focus and interest with SDI and something that Zeke and I have talked about from day one uh, of his involvement with SDI and how I end up on the Board of Advisors is the idea of trying to take what we're doing at Personal Defense Network, which is offering these course modules, these online courses with certificates if people successfully pass the test, what I've done at ADSI, 
and what I've done at IC training and possibly be able to build all of that content into an accredited program for firearms instructors. You know, that to me is kind of the ultimate goal of all this, to, to really get people who are interested in teaching others, interested in helping others, the same kind of products that we're now being able to bring to people who are interested in, in learning this information for themselves and just distributing it at a much wider scale because we take all the travel expenses out of the equation. That's great. And, and you, were, um, you mentioned a little bit about um, kind of the theories and techniques behind actual personal defensive training. And I've read a couple of your other things on some of the websites um, that talk about that mental side and the biomechanical side of things rather than just being out on a range and practicing the, the moves, if you will. So how, how much of that do you think is, what's the mix there? You know, is it um, when you're talking about personal defense, how much of it is body and mind and how much of it is out on the range practicing, you know? Well, ultimately with something like, you know, shooting a gun, developing defensive, defensive skills with a firearm, you have to be out on the range. But deciding how you're going to train, what drills you're going to use, what gun you're going to choose, what holster you're going to choose, where you're going to uh, carry, you know, where you're going to wear the holster, all of those things are, are critical thinking decisions. They're not they're logic-based decisions, and the more educated you are, the, the better prepared you are to make those decisions. You know, a lot of people want to turn those types of decisions into um, either just trusting someone, right, blindly sort of going to an expert, and, and including myself, right? That someone will see me on TV and they'll say, well, what gun do you carry, Rob? And they'll assume that the gun I carry then must be a great choice for them. And whether somebody goes to, you know, see what gun the Navy SEALs are using or see what gun their neighbor, the cop, is using or whatever, like all of those things could be horribly flawed as approaches. I'd much rather educate someone on the criteria they should use to select a gun for themselves, um, give them a, a, a list of uh, features that they should look for or avoid in defensive firearms, and then use that knowledge to go to the store and then physically put the gun in their hand when, once they've narrowed the field. If you just go walk into a gun shop and there's a hundred different models of guns, Somebody might say, well, gee, there's a hundred different options here. And really there aren't. There's probably seven, right, in the average gun shop that really are appropriate to be looked at for personal offense in 2015. But there are 93 other guns that you can weed out just to a, a critical thinking and logical approach. And, and some of that will have to do with your body type, some of it have to do with your hand size, some of it have to do with the way you dress, whether the gun's for home defense or to be carried in public. There's a lot of variables that you can apply the information that can be read in an article or learned through a lecture that you can be tested on and that somebody like myself or, or like what you guys do with SDI can say, yes, we, we now believe that you have learned this information and we're going to give you, you know, this grade or we're going to give you this certificate and, and you can now go forward with that. And for a lot of people, that's just a pride or an ego thing. But for others, especially as we look at the instructor side, you know, that's a credential. It's something that, that now if someone is educated, it's one thing to say, I'm a firearms instructor. I can teach you how to shoot. But now I've got this certificate that says that this other entity, this trusted, respected entity that has a long track record of, of educating instructors says that I have learned the correct way to advise and counsel someone on selecting a defensive handgun. And, and if, if the average person is going online and looking at 15 different CCW instructors in their hometown, the guy with better education, the guy with, with more information, the guy that's, that's got these certificates and got this education is probably going to be the more attractive choice. You know, certainly all other things being equal, but, but I think from a business development point too, someone who is able to convey this intellectual information and not just teach the physical shooting part uh, is infinitely more valuable to their student as well. So I tell students when we're, when we're standing on the range at you know, 9.03 in the morning, getting ready to start a two-day combat focus shooting class, at, at some point in that first 10, 15 minutes of discussion, I make it very clear that if it were up to me, if we had to choose, between standing on the line and shooting or sitting down in the chairs to back the range and discussing concepts, I believe their better bang for the buck and their better value is two days with me, question and answer, understanding the concepts, lectures, intellectual points that they then can take with them for the rest of their lives into their gear, tactics, technique selection, and their practice on the range. Because ultimately, if we just practice on the range, they're still not going to own those physical skills at the end of two days. Sure. They've still got to go out and practice. And if they don't understand the concepts and, and principles and philosophies underlying how they should practice and what they should be doing, then they're just going to move on and, and maybe get distracted by the next you know, YouTube video of a new technique. And that's the, that's the pitfall. That's the, the, the antithesis of what we do is, is people that want to go out and take a timer to the range, try two different techniques, and just arbitrarily choose the faster one 
on the range without thinking about how the technique actually relates to the application of skill in the real world versus their performance of a skill in an isolated choreographed environment. Sure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I actually, I know you spent so much time just then t talking about not worrying about specific firearms in generalities, but we do have a couple questions here from, from students that are, active, that are asking about specific firearms. Do you want to go into those or do you want to leave it there as it really is an individual thing and you know. No, let's let's go because some of the questions, are, they're probably exactly the kind of questions that we get a lot from students. Sure. And I'd love to hear what they are, and then I, maybe I can talk about some of those principles and concepts that we, sure. we advise people on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the first ones we got was, is the Phoenix pistol, and this is, again, we got a couple of these that are very specific firearms. Is the Phoenix pistol with the, and I believe this is an item number 0074. Right in the middle of that. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Okay. So we're looking for um, the Phoenix pistol. With the 22 LR bullets, I believe the item number he included here, that's 0074, it's by CCI. Is that a good defense, self-defense weapon? That's um, so the CCI sounds like the ammunition. Yes. Uh, that, that's an ammunition for 22. Yep. The, the Phoenix gun, I actually have one of those guns, and I haven't had a, I, I got it like an NRA, Friends of the NRA raffle ticket kind of drawing thing. Uh -huh. And it, it honestly, I didn't find it to be as reliable as... I would suggest people look for in a defensive handgun. So that particular gun, I have one example. I've never seen one a student show up to the range with one. My one example you know, doesn't make the recommended list. The let, look, looking at the bigger picture, um, that gun, as I recall, has a really small uh, manually operated external safety. If it's the one I'm thinking of, and we, we tell people to stay away from those. Uh, we want it, we want a more efficient gun design. And then in 22 long rifle in general, then we go to the, the criteria of, of caliber. You know, we recommend 9 millimeter uh, for personal defense, mm -hmm. pretty, pretty universally. If someone has a situation where they are very uh, recoil averse, if there's an actual strength, coordination, dexterity issue to the point where I would actually put this person in the you know, physical, physical, physically disabled side of things, like not not normal human being range of motion, not normal human being muscular control, not normal human being strength. If someone is below that line, then they might consider a caliber under 9mm. But, but I've seen plenty of people who say, well, I can't handle 9mm. They show up at the range and they're just using bad technique. And once we teach them the proper technique and get them in the proper body positions, get them the proper grip, maybe get them a gun that uh, fits their hand better, is more reliable, is more efficient, all of those concerns tend to go away for for ninety percent, ninety nine percent of the population. So uh, we don't recommend twenty two long rifle. Now the, the the red herring is that someone's always going to say, "Well, are you saying that it, you you'd get shot by a twenty two, or are you saying that you don't think a twenty two could st save someone's life?" And obviously, those things that those are facetious arguments that sure. you could defend yourself with a thirty out six hunting rifle. You could defend yourself with a, a slingshot. You know, so but but we certainly wouldn't recommend 22 long rifle as a starting point uh, in a defensive handgun. Sure. Um, similar question for the High Point CF 380 pistol. I'm sure, and and a lot of this is going to go back to stuff that we already talked about. But but just as a general review, High Point CF 380 pistol is a self defense weapon. Yeah, I've never shot one, never held one. I don't even. I, I would probably recognize it as a high point if I saw it. I'm just okay. familiar with the product line. It's definitely not a uh, product line that we recommend based on uh, reliability, ergonomics, kind of like almost every factor you could put in there. Sure. And both of those guns are on the less expensive side uh, of the of those hundred guns you're going to see in a gun shop. What what I would caution people to to avoid is a uh, you know a, a bargain based kind of decision-making process when, when it comes to firearms. Um, this is a life and death tool. It, the only reason that you have it is you're carrying it around in public is to protect yourself in a worst case scenario. Now, if someone can't afford a gun that costs more than $150, you know, sure, there are choices out there. Uh, but probably that person is going to be better served by a used gun of a higher quality that they've, you know, been able to practice or test to see that it has the reliability they need than they are buying a brand new gun. If there's a new gun with a retail price of, of under three hundred and fifty dollars, I, I would say I would be very skeptical that it is uh, going to hit the reliability and the features level that we look for in a defensive gun. So someone in on a really, 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 really on a budget, 
uh, but can go through all the other things they need to go through, including getting the training, uh, they're probably going to be better served by a used gun than they are a new gun in that okay. price range. Great. Um, how about this is uh, from one of our webinar attendees, Kelly, carrying a G26 with the standard magnet and a G19 mag as the reload. Any disadvantages to that? No, that sounds brilliant. I carried a, a Glock 26 for a long time, um, off and on with a, a modified uh, Glock 19 that I carry that had a 26 length grip. Uh, so I carried that for a few years, um, that particular gun for a couple years, and um, it's a great defensive gun. It's, it's definitely on the highly recommended list. And choosing to, a subcompact gun for carryability, but then having the standard size or even the full Glock 17 size uh, magazine as your, your backup magazine for reloads in a worst case scenario is, is the way a lot of people go, and it's, it's certainly a great choice. Cool. Um, I have a question here, and I know that you could probably, probably can and have written a book on it, but um, this is from Kelly again. Which, march, which martial art best blends in with firearm skills? And I'll let you know, it's going to cut me off in about seven minutes here. I must have logged in a little too early, so keep it short, and we'll try to get one or two more in here, and, and then we'll cut out a little early. Sound good? Oh, okay. Um, so that. really, there, I don't think there is one martial art that covers everything. Uh, I advise people to take a look at uh, strike close quarter striking skills from Muay Thai. Um, take a look at fundamental grappling skills from a, a good jiu-jitsu school, Brazilian jiu-jitsu school, preferably one that isn't overly involved in um, competition, you know, one that's more training people for combatives. But even the fundamental skills that you learn in the sport side of jiu-jitsu are going to be the kinds of, of fundamental grappling skills. A lot of people just aren't comfortable in contact with another human body, and they, they don't know how to use leverage, use their hips, use their uh, strength, you, how to get someone off balance, how to move while in contact, like sort of around someone's body or move them around on your body. And any of those wrestling, grappling techniques are going to be important in an extreme close quarters environment. So Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, uh, Muay Thai for the, the striking uh, th those are that's that's traditionally where I've always sent people. You know, go do three to six months of each one of those, and then practice the fundamental things you learn. If you stick with any one art over an extended period of time, eventually you're going to get into more of the artness than you are the martialness of it, and that's something you want to avoid if you're really just trying to, you know, collect your your defensive skill set as opposed to pra practice an art. Perfect. That's great. Um, I have two questions left here, and Josh, I'm going to try to get to yours next. Um, Tim, who was on the webinar as well, sent this in a little bit earlier. Um, he's got a little bit of a backstory that um, he's worried about carrying. He can't carry at work, um, but he wants to carry to and from. So, do you have any um, suggestions for him as as to people who are not allowed allowed to carry to work but want to carry them to and from work? He's a lot of times running in, running errands, going somewhere, and um, just kind of wants to know the best way to to go about doing that flexibility and all that. Good yeah, stuff. The, the first, you know, kind of, I'll throw out the blanket, you know, you have to know what the local laws are, sure. and you always have to, you know, comply with the private property owners, but if you uh, have a quick access safe, um, like like gun vault stuff that I use, the, the little nano vaults, or you can mount the speed vault, any other vaults, mounting one of those in your trunk or, you know, out of sight in the, in the under the seat, something like that, in the passenger apartment, a lot of them come with cables that can be secured to hard points, like the, the base of your car seats, things like that. Um, any kind of a lockable storage area that you can put inside of your vehicle um, that is, and obviously having the gun and that storage area out of sight so someone isn't just going to break the window and take the box. Uh, I think that's completely viable. I travel with, with firearms locked up in, in vaults and cases all the time in my vehicle. Certainly I go into a restaurant, I, I go into places where the, the vehicle is left unattended with some of those guns. Doesn't necessarily, you know, I, I travel with a lot of guns uh, quite often for, for classes and demonstrations and things, television shows, videotaping, so I may still be carrying my personal gun into the, wherever I'm running my errand, but out in the car there's going to be other vehicle, other guns in the vehicle. I, I don't see anything wrong with that. I think you have to know the environment you're, you're parking in. You have to, you know, kind of understand the risk and benefit of that situation, um, but, but definitely securing the gun. Now, here's, here, then the, you get the big question, well, do I take, do I unload the gun and reload the gun as I'm taking it in and out of my holster? You know, the best thing to do is not mess with your gun, right? Like, once it's loaded, leave it loaded, leave it in a holster. Something like our modular belly band, the IC training company modular belly band, is, is one of the things that, that we keep in mind with that is that you can detach the holster module from the belly band, put it in a quick access safe, keep it locked, and then 
you know, go about your business. So even when you come home at night, you, you want to take it off, put that gun in your quick access safe. The trigger is still covered. There's still a holster module around the gun, and the gun stays loaded all the time. So you don't have to constantly mess with loading and unloading. We know a lot of accidents happen, particularly if people are in awkward situations in their car and they're not used to manipulating the gun in that seated position, steering wheel, whatever, especially trying to hide it from people walking by. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong there. So if you can legally keep the gun in a box, loaded, locked, and you feel like that is secure given those circumstances, I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, it's something that I know a lot of people do with their defensive guns regularly, and, and I think it's well within the, the realm of common practice. Perfect. And I think we're going to run out of time for the last one, but um, Rob, I, I may reach out to you and, and then directly get back to Joshua on his question. He had a question about um, preventing errant rounds going airborne. Um, you had posted a picture on it, so I'll, I'll get with you on that personally. Um, but where can people go for information on your on your training programs? What's the best way to figure out? We had a question about whether or not you're going to be in Indiana, all that good stuff. I'm not going to be in Indiana, but I will be uh, in Illinois a lot uh, in May. I'm going to be in, uh, so they can go to personaldefensenetwork.com. Uh, okay. That's a, the best place to get, you know, follow-up information. Just use that search bar, you know, use that sure. search bar. It's going to let me Google that for you. Use the search bar at Personal Defense Network, and you'll probably find information on stuff you're looking for for personal defense. Otherwise, icetraining.us is a great place to um, see the training calendar and all the schedule. CombatFocusShooting.com also has a training calendar for all the certified combat focus shooting instructors that are active in the program and of course you can hit me on social media so I, I manage all my own social media so if you see either of the Rob Pincus Facebook pages uh, Rob Pincus or Rob Pincus Pro my Instagram my Twitter I do all those um, we have a discussion uh, site at Facebook for IC training uh, as well that people can ask questions and we, you know, hopefully everybody gets the value. People can always send me an email, but it's a lot better if you ask the question in public because somebody else is probably going to benefit from it as well. Um, just the idea of, of you know, pointing the get muzzle high, we, it's been something that's been talked about a lot on the internet lately, a lot of social media drama about it. The fact is I, I think that you are entering into a realm of recklessness if you just habitually point the gun up over the berm. and you know, that bullet has to come down somewhere if, if it, the gun goes off. So especially with beginning students, especially when we're first running through a couple of days of combat focus shooting, we tell everybody to keep the muzzle low. It also happens to be more efficient. The gun starts in a low position from the holster. You know, there are extenuating circumstances and situations where it does make sense to point the muzzle high, um, but not as a standard default way to carry a rifle or a pistol, um, particularly if we think about our responsibility as firearms owners uh, out in public ranges. Perfect. Thank you so much. We're gonna we're on our last couple seconds here, so um, just so everybody knows, I will be posting the link to this on our Facebook page. Send out an email blast, all that good stuff. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and Rob, thank you so so much for your time. This was really beneficial, and thanks for letting me uh, you know get my wrinkles out on this first webinar here. I appreciate your I appreciate your patience on all that as well. So we really do. Sure, I hope we can do it again. Uh, yeah. I'm really I'm proud of being associated with SDI, and, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to do this again. Awesome. Thanks so much. Okay. So thanks, I, think, I think that's about it. You still there, Zay? All right. Thanks, guys. I'll, I'll get you this information yep. out as soon as Sorry. I can. All right. Thanks. Everybody All have right. a good night, and thanks for attending.